Thank you so much, and I'm sorry to interrupt your lunch. Um, it's such an honor to be here, and the conference has been so astonishing. And to hear the Nuremberg prosecutors this morning was just so inspiring. And I can tell you that one of the great achievements of my lifetime, I think, is when I was asked to direct Whitney Harris's Institute at Washington University, which is an honor and a pleasure. Um, we have a fairly sober lunch and talk. Um, Grace Acalo, who I'll introduce in a moment, is going to speak to us as, about her life as a child soldier and what can be done about it. I recommend enormously this book, which is on sale out uh, in the hallway. I read it last night, and um, I confess you might need some tissues or Kleenex when you read it because it's, it's a pretty sad story, but it's also a story full of hope. Um, there's another small commercial advertisement, which is for those of you interested in the International Criminal Court. Um, one of my articles is out there for free, so you don't have to buy it, <laughs> actually, that describes the court and its operation. It's legal, so it's a little technical, but there's been a lot of questions about the court, and maybe that will help us. What I thought I might do by way of introduction, um, rather than telling you about Grace, who's going to tell her own story in her own words, is set the stage a little bit for what is going on in terms of child soldiers and international law. This morning, Mike Newton gave us a wonderful lecture, inviting us to look not at each of the stars in the sky, but I think he said something to the effect of relax our eyes and see the patterns present um, forming constellations. And yet, we have to remember that the patterns are formed from individual stars, one of whom I'm going to introduce today, Grace Acalo, is an extraordinary star, as you'll discover for yourself. Um, she was abducted as a child from school, enslaved and subjected to atrocities, saved by her faith in God, and now working to help others less fortunate. Let me talk a little bit about the conflict in which she was embroiled and about the problem of child soldiers more generally. Human rights groups estimate that there are approximately 300,000 child soldiers in the world spread out in 33 different countries. Uganda is a country that has suffered enormously from the plague of child soldiers. Uganda is a landlocked country in East Africa bordered on the east by Kenya, on the north by Sudan, on the west by the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, on the southwest by Rwanda, and on the south by Tanzania. Now just by saying the names of these countries, you can see that almost every one of them is either right now a subject of a referral to the International Criminal Court, or has been a place where atrocities have taken place, or is a place where atrocities are still taking place. So this is an area very much troubled by war. International human rights law and international humanitarian law prohibit the use of child soldiers. The International Criminal Court statute even has a provision making it a war crime to conscript soldiers under the age of 15. In Sierra Leone, which is where David Crane and Stephen Rapp were prosecutors. Uh, thousands of children were recruited and used by all sides in the conflict, both the army side and by the rebels. And there's another wonderful book by Ishmael Bia about his uh, sufferings as a child soldier in Sierra Leone. Typically what happens in these cases is the soldiers come in, they round up everybody in the village, often they force the children to kill their parents or a brother or sister in order to conscript them and then give them drugs and other um, sufferings in order to increase their adherence to the rebel movement. Uganda, now Sierra Leone was the first um, case in which using child soldiers was charged and prosecuted and convicted as a war crime. And the special court is to be congratulated for doing that. I think in some ways that paved the way for the International Criminal Court in the Ugandan referral to also charge Joseph Kony, who is the leader of the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda, responsible for the abduction of um, Grace and others like her, with conscripting child soldiers as a war crime. 
And one of the astonishing things that we never would have thought when we were all sitting in Rome in the summer of 1998 negotiating the International Criminal Court Treaty, nobody thought that states were going to be referring their own situations to the ICC. I don't think anybody thought that would happen. And Uganda was actually the first case that was brought to the court when President Museveni um, brought his case to the ICC. Now, one of the delicate issues for the ICC, and I'm sure Fatou Bansouda could speak to that much better than I, is obviously when you refer an entire country, the ICC has the delicate issue of getting the cooperation of the government of that country, which it may also need to investigate for war crimes. And that, I think, is something that the court will face as it goes on. But uh, Uganda has been a place troubled by war since its independence in 1962. Uh, many of you will remember Idi Amin and his depredations in the 1970s. Uh, the current president has led a regime that is much more human rights friendly, but the Lord's Resistance Army continues to rage in the north. And maybe one of the things we can talk about a little bit, if there are questions for, for Grace later, is the issue of the ICC arrest warrants, which were highly criticized by many in the international community as destabilizing the region. I think after you hear Grace's story, I think you'll realize that it's not the ICC destabilizing the region, it's Joseph Kony and the Lord's Resistance Army, but I'll leave you to judge that for yourself. Um, without further ado then, I'd like to introduce Grace, and I'd like to just read yet another, if you'll indulge me, uh, one of the other uh, blessings from the Chautauqua Sacred Ceremony. I think Grace was very much saved by her faith. And Grace, I'd like to offer you this in the Chautauqua spirit as a blessing to take you on your way. And it's from the, um, the category called Chautauqua as Hope. And I think your story is about hope. And it reads, eyes will close, but you, under unsleeping, watch by our side. Death may come in love's safe keeping, still we abide. God of love, all evil quelling, sin forgiving, Fear dispelling. Stay with us, our hearts indwelling this even tide. Praise the call. Thank you. Standing here like a mosquito in the forest with uh, no knowledge of legal issues, but at least a little for justice. Um, good afternoon. It's a privilege to be here, and I want to say thank you to Mr. David Crane for inviting me for this event. I'm here standing thinking about justice, which I don't understand. But I always ask myself, what is justice to a child who is hungry, thirsty, have no shelter over his, him or her head? What is justice to a man or a woman whose home has been burnt down, his child or a child has been forced into army? What is justice for a child who has been pulled from his or her mother's lap and forced into the army? What is justice for a woman or a man whose hands, legs, limbs, nose, and ears have been cut off? I stand here as experienced the Lord's resistant army as Layla introduced before, came to my school and abducted 139 girls in my school. As Leila introduced that Uganda was not, got its, its independence in 1962, but since then, we never got peace. We had the first president who got the um, independence, uh, got into the office after the independence, Obote. And then we had Amin who killed a lot of intellectuals, educated people. Then the present president came in, 
He came through coup, war. He entered into the bush. But we thought he was um, a, sav a savior for us. The whole country was rejoicing. And then Connie started waging war, not against the government, but against the innocent people, against the future, against the children. It was the LRA who came and abducted me on the night of 1996, October, and took me into the bush. But Sister Akele, a hero which is not known anywhere, but known in my heart, followed these rebels. Not because she had a special favor, but because of the love that she had for her own children, for her own students. She was, she accepted to be insulted. She accepted to die for us, but she rescued 109 girls. But if 30 of us were retained by the Lost Resistant Army, and we started our journey, the journey we never knew would survive from. As we started moving with the Lost Resistant Army, there was no hope of returning. There was no hope of someone knowing that we exist. We started moving and we saw the atrocities that the Lost Resistant Army were doing. They were killing people, cutting people's limbs. They were abducting children, burning people's houses. And people left the village and the village became silent like never anybody had never lived there before. We suffered as child soldiers beatings from these people, the Lost Resistant Army. The children abducted were beaten until they no longer know who they are. They were forced to kill their own parents when they are abducted. And on the way, if you don't, if you're not strong, you're killed. You're not released because if you're released, they think you're going to uh, reveal their secret. The first time I was forced to kill was a 12 year old girl who tried to escape. And she was found and all of us these 30 girls from St. Mary's College Aboke, a small town in Uganda, were forced to beat this girl to death. The family that tried to hide this girl, and a woman was pregnant, almost due, were both beaten to death. And we started our journey. After two months roaming in Uganda, killing people, abducting more children, we were marched into Sudan, southern Sudan. And I remember clearly that al-Bashir was sending his own soldiers to receive us in the camp and are talking because we didn't understand the language. Welcome in their language and welcome to help us fight in southern Sudan because they were using the Lost Resistant Army to fight the SPLA, the Sudan's People's Liberation Army. And through that, the Lost Resistant Army were getting ammunition from Al-Bashir. I was trained to be a soldier, not really a real training as a soldier, but I was trained to dismantle, clean and assemble the gun. But I was left to learn to shoot by myself because I was told hunger would teach me how to shoot. Sure enough, hunger taught me how to shoot. And there's a word that people say, kill or to be killed, which is going wrong and which is a truth. You don't kill, you die. And nobody wants to die. Human beings are always afraid of death. So you kill to survive. I was sent to fight the people in southern Sudan. 
Luckily, I was not sent back to Uganda, and luckily my family was not killed. I survived bullet fight flying around, and that's why I refer to my faith, because I don't think anybody else could have saved me from what I was going through. I was buried alive, but I survived that, and that I refer to my faith too, because I don't think anybody, even my mother who loves me so much, could have saved me from it. And after seven months in captivity, I escaped. I had no intention or I had no idea or I had not planned to escape because Sudan was like a grave. Nobody even plans to escape. You try, that's your death. Either you're killed, hunger will kill you, thirst will kill you, or the, the Bashir people, we used to refer them the Arabs, would kill you. Or the Sudan People's Liberation Army would kill you because we were sent to fight them and to kill them. So they would not trust us when we try to escape to their hands. The Ugandan government soldiers attacked the camp that we're living in together with the Sudan Liber People's Liberation Army. And that way, I got my chance to escape. I ran away into the bush and spent three days and three nights alone. No food, nothing, but I survived. The fourth day, I found a group of girls, a group of children, actually. I don't remember the number, who were hiding from the same fight that we were in. And they asked me, where are you going? And I told them, I'm going to Uganda. I had no idea where to go. I'd lost the direction of Uganda because we followed a different direction and I was in a different direction to go. But I believed entirely that I was going to Uganda. They said, you are the one, you and the other 30 girls who have caused all this to us. This fighting, they have come because of you. We're going to kill you and then we'll go. And I told them, I've also been trained. So before you kill me, I will also kill one person. But I wasn't going to do that. I was just scaring them away from me. And one of them was said, you're going to waste your time. She's going to die on the way before she reaches Uganda because look at her, she's weak. And all of us were weak, even these children. So they left, and they left me there, and I started walking by myself. But three girls came back from the same group, and they said, do you want to die here? And I told them, I'm not going to die, I'm going to Uganda. And they thought I knew the way to Uganda. They remained with me. Then the others came, and we were like nine of us together. And they thought I was their leader, but in real sense, I had no direction. We walked like blind people, but it was the Sudan People's Liberation Army who actually rescued us and took us to their camp. And from there, they handed us to Ugandan um, soldiers, where I was taken back to Uganda. I continued with my education. I went back to the same high school I was abducted from, and I completed a high school. And I went to Uganda Christian University, thinking, what can I do for my friends? What can I, I didn't think of myself. First of all, I didn't believe I was the one surviving, um, walking around, going to school. And in 2005, 2004, the Amnesty International invited me to come and speak at their annual meetings. It was my first time to stand in the big crowd, to speak to a big crowd. I went back after that and I applied to Gordon College, uh, transferred to Gordon College in 2005, and I graduated last year with my communication degree. But since I came out of the bush 
And since I came here, in Uganda I had no chance to talk. I was active, I was, I have no degree in counseling, but I tried my best to counsel my friends, to counsel the children who came back. I would go to a center and stay there and counsel them and talk to them. I would try to reintegrate them to their families and try to find a way if they can go back to school. And those who didn't have parents try to find a foster family or somebody to take care of them. But when I came here, I looked at it as a chance to speak about the atrocities committed in Uganda. I looked at it as a chance that people who had freedom here could actually do something for northern Ugandan people. So I started going around speaking, helped by World Vision, and I testified in front of the Congress 2006. But I'm standing here not just to tell my story, but to let you reflect or let you know that as I stand now, there are children who are wandering like me. Who can bring justice to us? What does justice look like? What is my future like? And we're going to ask ourselves in the future when these same children are going to turn or become terrorists or go back to the bush and commit the same atrocities. What really happened? We're going to ask ourselves. And people with legal knowledge, I don't have that, I said it before. I think you have a great responsibility because justice brings everlasting peace. Without justice, there is no peace. We're going to pretend that we're talking peace, but there are people hurting that need justice. We're going to pretend that we are forgiven, but there's no forgiveness in a mass forgiveness. There's somebody hurting. There's somebody who needs justice. There's somebody who needs something to be done for her or his child. For what they did to him or her, cut her lips or legs. We're going to see all this come up later if justice is not done. And that applies in Uganda. They came up with a system of forgiveness which I totally agree that there should be forgiveness, but justice must take its course because there are people hurting. The ICC indictment to Connie was good, but to me, it came a little later, late. We've talked about genocide, defining genocide. At what level should we call killing a genocide? To me, even five people killed in a day, two people killed in a day, should have a word for it, a word that make people understand that killing is not good, and people who are responsible should face justice. And that's to me as a lay person, not as a legal person, because life is very important. And, um, I have a quote here, it says, true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it's the presence of justice. Not all the darkness of the land can hide the lifted high and the hand. What can, what can make us hear the cries of, for peace? Not only have we shut our ears from the clanging bell for peace, we have looked away from the tears of the afflicted. Peace has to be created, to be maintained. It's a product of faith, strength, energy, will, sympathy, justice, imagination, and triumph. It will never be created in the way of arms, passivity, and quietness. Respect for human beings and development of human life require peace. 
peace is not merely the absence of war and is not limited to maintaining the balance of powers between the adversaries. Peace cannot be attained on earth without the safeguarding the good of persons. Free communication among men, respect for the dignity of persons and people, and the assiduous practice of fraternity. Peace is the tranquility of order. Peace is the work of justice and the effect of charity. The accumulation of arms strike many as paradoxically suitable way of deterring potential adversaries from war. They see it as a way, the most effective means of ensuring peace among nations. This method of deterring gives rise to a strong moral preservation. The arms do not ensure peace. Far from eliminating the cause of war, it's a risk aggravating them, spending enormous sum to produce ever new uh, types of weapons impressed upon, upon the aid needy population. It swats the development of people. Overarmament multiplies reasons for a conflict and increases the danger of ex escalating resistance from the people you are trying to stop by the way of arms. Young people have always taken the full gravity of injustices brought by the people in the authority. The hatred is created in their hearts. When we talk of civil war in Africa, and especially in Uganda, it does not come out of the blue. It begins slowly from the heart of someone who has never had peace in their life, like the fasana subterranean uh, termite that eat the house from the underground, and then at the end, we see the house falling down. It's like a little seed that we ignore, but after a big tree comes with full blooming leaves and flowers, we begin to say, what was the cause of the leaves and the flowers? War comes from poverty, hunger, frustration, and greed for the human race. I have always said to myself, what do we do to create peace and justice as people? And I believe as lawyers, legal people, you have a responsibility. I have my responsibility to create justice and peace and to maintain it. Thank you very much. still living but they're still in Uganda. I have my um, nine months old baby which is part of my life now and uh, he's back home with the father here. Um, I would like for you to share your opinion. Uh, yesterday there was a discussion on balance between um, uh, justice and peace and in, in the case of Uganda there is still an ongoing discussion on whether to refer the case to the ICC or whether just peace is more important. And uh, you and I discussed that last night, and I would love to sh for you to share your opinion on, in the case of Northern Uganda, the importance of peace versus justice. Well, both two, they both two are very important. Peace and justice are all important. But how do we acquire them? That's the question. Um, the ongoing discussion in Uganda whether to let the um, peace talk go and uh, find the way of getting peace in northern Uganda um, without the ICC is a lie because it's never going to work out. People have been hurting for a long time, for 21 years, and to let the LRA get away with what they've done 
is not justice and it's not peace. It's suppression of the pain that people have. Yes, because the LRA before had never come out, bef uh, out publicly to defend themselves before the ICC issued an indictment against them. And after you, uh, the ICC in issued the indictment, Connie came out defending himself, trying to ask for peace and trying to uh, tell the ICC to back off so that he can um, make peace. The ICC plays a great role, I think, in this kind of um, wars. And people who are against it, I think, are against justice because it's the ICC or the. Let me talk about the ICC in general because that's working with Uganda. Even our president, because our president is not an angel, when when he hears about the ICC or when ICC was investigating Uganda, including him, he was frightened. He was trying to um, cooperate with the ICC or, with, or whoever comes with the idea of peace or indicting these people because he was afraid of the ICC and Connie came out too. So the I ICC is very important. Organization. Maybe one last question. Uh, what is the present role of education in your in your country, and how does that fit in with your hopes for for uh, peace and faith? Um, the present role for education. Role of education. Of education. Well, education in Uganda, let me say, is very important, but also it's theoretical. It's not practical, which I'm trying to, I might write a paper on it. We have, let me say, we have a freedom of education, but we come out and there's no jobs and you don't have any experience or any practical experience you got from school to start your own way of life. But I have at the same time, there's so many children who are not going to school. And then we have the universal primary education, which they say is for all the children. But in a real sense, these children don't get education because the teachers who are supposed to teach them don't get paid. And people who have money, they tend to take their children to private schools. So education in Uganda has some kind of, it has to be changed. Grace, thank you so much again.